Andrew, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Super glad to be here. I've been watching you on Twitter. Really excited about what you're doing for the social token space. So uh, really grateful to be here. Amazing. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. You're building something really, really cool at Social Stack. So why don't we just get right into it? Give me a quick brief about yourself and specifically tell me what were you doing before crypto and kind of what you're doing now? Yeah. So my previous company uh, was actually a podcast media company. Uh, so I graduated from Virginia Tech in 2015 uh, and kind of in the years after school, I spent that going down the entrepreneur startup route. And kind of my main thing was I started a podcast called the Global Startup Movement. And it was really something that evolved from me just interviewing a, a different entrepreneur in a different city every week to me acting more as an independent media company and really focusing on uh, finding the biggest issues in emerging market tech and innovation industries, finding the people closest to those issues and just bringing them on the podcast. Um, and so that kind of grew into a whole portfolio of brands. Our two flagship podcasts for that company were African Tech Roundup, which focused on uh, Africa's digital transformation journey and the global startup movement, which was kind of broader emerging market tech and innovation focused. Um, and really the core of that journey for me, was just living the... Um, early stage of the creator economy, because we had these two pretty traction podcasts. We had a really high quality niche audience for both of them um, that found it very difficult to extract meaningful commercial value from the podcasts. And so I, I lived kind of all the challenges of being a creator in the early days of the creator economy starting to take shape. Um, and so a lot of that experience kind of plays into now my um, ideas and vision for what social stack is starting to become. And, you know, I think that as a creator, COVID accelerated a lot and kind of, you know, made it so that we now have viable, uh, business models that, you know, a creator can even expand what they're doing beyond just a lifestyle business into something more scalable. And now that we have these new tools, these new web three tools of NFTs and social token uh, there's kind of additional layer now that uh, or additional toolkit that cr creators have to work with to really uh, get their audience and more skin in the game with what they're building, uh, make their audience feel like owners as well and get them more engaged. Um, so the you know vision for social stack was really on the back end of me spending five years building that podcast company. Got you. And I know I know you guys are really big on the on the mission driven side of social tokens, right? And we'll get into that in, in just a sec because you touched upon that for 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 a minute. But I, I want to learn more about like how did you get into crypto? Like what's that story? Everybody has a unique kind of way in. What's yours? Yeah, I mean, mine was pretty simple. Just back in college, you know, 2014, my junior year at Virginia Tech, I uh, just came across Bitcoin. That was when it was around like six hundred dollars. Just from uh, some friends actually talking about it. So. Um, Steam it by uh, Dan Larimer mm. actually built Steam it, I believe, in the Blacksburg, um, the corporate innovation center. Um, and so there was kind of like there's this interesting blockchain uh, community that's in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, that most people wouldn't really be aware of. If they don't know it, but that was my initial foray into Bitcoin. And so it was just very much so, just like the kind of college kids in in a dorm room talking about it. And so I didn't have that much money when I tell people, oh, I, you know, I got into Bitcoin back in like 2013, 2014, like. You know, I was a college kid. I didn't have that much money to come in with, to the space with, but it really caught my fascination and um, been thinking deeply about the space for many years now. And even with the podcast company, a lot of the content that we covered was, you know, crypto blockchain focused, especially mm. um, within an Africa context. Got you. A lot of people tend to confuse the difference between NFTs and social tokens. Some even call social tokens NFTs, right? Some people categorize them social tokens as fungible and non-fungible. How do you kind of think about the two and, and their difference and their similarities? Well, I mean, I think they're they're both in the, sim, in the same category in my mind, but they're both different tools for how a creator or a community leader can actually uh, you know, leverage the blockchain technology to start to provide some tangible ways to start to facilitate this process of uh, earning and redeeming back and forth between themselves and their community. Uh, so I think finally, blockchain has the tangible um, interfaces and tools where it's now useful for the creator economy. And we're seeing the initial use case of art kind of playing out over the past year with that. Um, but 
you know, it's it's at its core, it's as simple as you just said, NFTs are non-fungible tokens and social tokens are fungible tokens. And each in my mind will enable different components of the creator stack that's that's uh, forming in Web3. Um, you know, I think NFTs are able to facilitate things that are unique items from content that the creator is producing to one-off event tickets or private, you know, um, like, you know, one-off concerts, conferences that, uh, you know, platforms like PoApp are currently uh, able to facilitate. And then the social tokens really the way we view it at, at Social Stack is it's a way for an issuer, a creator, a community leader, a brand uh, to connect deeper with their community. Um, and that really is a way, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new dynamic of community where the most active community members are going to achieve ownership in the community over time simply by engaging and earning the uh, community social token. Yeah, no, I, I get that. And you're seeing a lot of those like use cases come to life right now with these initial social token creators who are taking themselves public, right, and building interesting utility frameworks uh, around their fan base, around their audience. What are some of the more interesting, I guess, utility and, and incentives you've seen kind of be driven through social tokens to date? Uh, anything yeah. specific come to mind? I mean, there are a few early uh, use cases on the social stack platform that have emerged that are really compelling and kind of speak to our kind of vision of where social tokens should go, which is, you know, this is not a technology where we're building something for humans to be traded like a stock market. That's that like that shouldn't be that's not the vision. That's not the, the future that I want to create for my kids. <laughs> that's a very much like a bit clout vision, right? Yeah. Just and so people understand the difference, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, not to knock on what someone else is doing in the space. It's, it's like, I think we need multiple visions playing out in the space and then people can choose, you know, whichever culture, community, uh, vision of the future that they want to align themselves with. Um, but really the tangible use cases that have emerged on the platform, I think there are three key ones. The first is a, uh, echo lodge, actually an indigenous owned echo lodge that's based in Ecuador. Um, that's basically using the social token as a way to reward people for uh, coming to the Amazon and like doing experiences at the retreat center. Um, they're currently building out the next phase, which is building learning modules where, pe where people can learn more about the tribe, about the indigenous tribe, their culture, their practices, their traditions. And you can start to earn some of the social token in that way. And then on the flip side, you can redeem it for heavily discounted experiences at the Echo Lodge. And so like, it's a really compelling use case for how can a region unlock uh, ecotourism assets to create a socially driven meme of exchange that might be even more stable than some of the fiat currencies that are in some of these emerging economies. And you know, a lot of them are pretty heavily reliant on the US dollar to kind of operate. And so it's a really compelling uh, use case and like there's really exciting ways that or really exciting directions it can go in um, but that's think, probably that's probably one of the most exciting use cases that I've heard personally that's the first time I'm hearing about it uh, because there's actual practicality behind it right it's not mere speculation and it's not just being rewarded for committing an action like you're actually building an entire economy from this token which is super interesting but my question to you is where does this liquidity come from? How do they kind of think about that? Do they pump and create their own like Uniswap pools for this liquidity for their new social token? Like, how do they think about that? Well, so that's that's that token's actually on Celo. Um, oh, okay. So Ubase Ubase Swap uh, is a fork of Uniswap. Um, that's uh, uh, Celo's EVM compatible, but they've uh, you know altered it, and so all Celo based tokens are traded actually on Uniswap or excuse me, Ubase Swap. Um, so liquidity is an interesting conversation in the space right now. I mean, both for social tokens and for NFTs, but specifically social tokens, it's such an early stage of the asset class that most social tokens don't have liquidity. And really the only liquidity comes from, you know, the issuer setting up their own liquidity pool on Uniswap, uh, then adding liquidity to it. And so that's like, you know, V1 just reflective of how early of a nature of this, you know, of, of where we're at in the space. Um, you know, other players are looking at bonding curves and like, that's something we're actually exploring internally in social stack as well as, you know, when you put a, a token on a bonding curve, it's a price discovery mechanism where the, uh, price and supply goes up as people buy the coin and the price and supply go down along the curve as people sell the coin. Um, and so 
bonding curves are a really interesting way for a social token to kind of launch itself into the world with tangible liquidity. Um, but I think right now people should be thinking about this space as, uh, you know, ownership in the community network. And so these, these, the successful social tokens will eventually become DAOs. I think social Alex Mazmedge said on Twitter, like social tokens and DAOs are one and the same. And that's, that's true. Like any, any social token that gains traction will eventually come and, you know, become a full, a fully fledged DAO. And so liquidity will happen naturally in the long run. Um, in the short term, people should be thinking about these things as either a reward point system on steroids or as kind of the um, ability to earn ownership in a DAO. And you should be thinking long term of holding these social tokens. And I think, you know, even the ones that ha do have traction right now, like friends with benefits, like they're not people aren't thinking about speculation right now. They're thinking about long term holding this token, right. and something, you know, being a part of something bigger. Right. How do you advise creators that want to go more towards the bonding curve route versus lo the linear route? How do you think about that at Social Stack? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I think that right now I would really, really focus more on like the fixed supply. Like you don't need liquidity right now. Like what you need is the initial like people buying into the community um, because you at the end of the day, like what is going to need to happen in order for your social token to be successful is you need brand ambassadors. You need to activate community, identify and then activate community leaders that like really step up and take on uh, ownership role and start to become active in the DAO that is early and starting to form. And so if you're thinking of social tokens as like a new way that you're going to make money, like you're not, you're not thinking about it correctly right now because of the reality of where social tokens are. Um, I think what bonding curves introduce, it's, it's, it's a shortcut to liquidity. Um, and it's a shortcut to, to like that mindset. But I, I'm not the biggest fan right now of immediately putting a social token on a bonding curve. I think that it's something that will come over time with the maturity of the space and the maturity of tooling in the space. But right now you should be thinking about your social token as a way to incentivize the behavior that you want to see in your community and the most engaged uh, members of your, your most engaged fans the most engaged participants of the community that you already have and that you're you know continuing to grow you know they're really they're going to rise to the top by earning the most token and then over time you're gonna that's gonna become apparent and the ones that really believe in your core mission as a community like those are the ones if you're doing the fixed token supply route like those are the ones that are really going to be sticking around in the long run versus, you know, the kind of uh, the emotion of speculation, which isn't really it's not what we're going for here. Yeah. Would you agree or disagree that every every token that's like publicly listed on on these markets is in one way or another a social token to an extent? Um, I saw Jess Sloss tweeted that. Yeah, he just just did tweet that. Yeah. I think that's a little much because like to me, the, the core like innovation here with the social token component is like we finally have a, a cryptocurrency, a token mechanism where the value is derived solely by the underlying community, by the underlying social capital that the community brings to the table versus the traditional like, you know, uh, crypto model, which is the values derived from the from the technical component, from the network. And the network activity, the transactions, and like the technical component of the token. Obviously, like speculation will always be there, um, but I don't necessarily agree with that. I think a social-based currency is the trajectory of the social token space, um, and so I think that there has to be some sort of like distinction away from like the technology component. The technology component can or is like the toolkit that you use to facilitate like transferring mm -hmm. the token around but like the value the value of bitcoin or ether like it's derived from the technology and the network not necessarily like the the social you know completely driven by the social value but then on the other side you could argue that ethereum's community is like what drives a lot of the value and a lot of the participation and innovation from the diehard maxis that kind of rally and and push the price and et cetera, et cetera, right? So it does have that social element to it, right? I think 
maybe that's where he was coming from, that every single token has this social aspect, right? That has this, I guess, this, this point of engagement where you need the community to drive that engagement. And with Ethereum, you do have your incentives. While you probably don't get, I guess, rewarded for necessarily joining a Discord, right? And you get an X amount of tokens for doing so, like you do in all these other social token communities, right? But it has that that social token component. But just a interesting well, I, statement. So, so I, I do agree with, I, I partly agree with that. Like like the value and the reason when people tell me like, this is an Ethereum killer, that's an Ethereum killer because <laughs> of like technology. It's like, that's nonsense. Like the moat, a big part of the moat of Ethereum is the culture. It's the community that forms around it. And so of course, like that is present in things. Um, but like it's only one core component. Whereas when when I say social tokens, like there like the technology isn't what drives the value of any given social token. It's the underlying social capital and you know the value of the community there and and you know the market opportunities that the issuer is opening up for the token. And so I I, I get what I get whatever I get what you and Jess are saying there. Um, but it's more like uh, social token maxi versus like. Yeah, like every cryptocurrency has some sort of social component. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to talk more about social stack for a minute, right? We kind of touched upon the whole mission driven uh, piece that's core to social stack, uh, and what direction you and your team want to go towards. Yeah, so you you cut out there a little bit, but I think I, I got the gist of that. So, um, you know, really. There's, there's, in my mind, there's, there's a couple different versions of how social tokens are emerging and how people think about it. One is kind of the, what we talk about that bit clap model of, uh, you know, this is about trading people like a stock market and speculating on people in that way. I don't feel aligned with that feature as all. That's not the feature I want to help create. Um, and the other, you know, the other end of that spectrum and the direction that social stack is heading in is social tokens are. You know, this is this is a way for a community to connect deeper within itself. You know, this is a way to really create something that's founded upon gratitude and abundance, not on scarcity and fear, which is, I think, a lot of what drives the blockchain space and like that scarcity right. component. Like, right. there's there's there there is value in scarcity, and I get that, and. We also need other systems and other tools where we can build economies where gratitude, abundance, love is like the core of how these economies function. And that's where I think social to social tokens need to sit in the kind of stack of like different types of cryptocurrencies. And so, so social stack right now um, is focused on two components. There's the roadmap of our product. And then there's the roadmap of what we say consciousness or culture. And so as we build the toolkit, the wallet, the community engagement app that we have, um, as we build out the tools to actually run these social token economies and give that to people, we also need the kind of consciousness shift as a culture, as a society, towards this concept of you know these 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 mediums of exchange are about connecting deeper with each other, about like a creator rewarding their fans with that emotion of gratitude, and the fans rewarding like giving back to the creator with with that same emotion. And so we're, we're, we're constantly asking ourselves, like, how can we build tools, whether it's tools for gifting, tools for rewarding specific kind of engagement, that's a positive impact on the planet and the community, like, that that's how we're thinking about things. So the current iteration of social stack, uh, we have kind of three core uh, technology components that are the first part of our product roadmap. Uh, and that's the social token launch pad where we can issue tokens on either the open Ethereum or Celo blockchains. We have our social stack wallet, which is a non-custodial wallet um, with email accounts and password recovery. And so there's a little, um, we don't have to go on the podcast, obviously, but there's a technical um, innovation we've, we've put forward of how we create a non-custodial wallet with email accounts. Um, and essentially that wallet now is multi-chain. So we've listed... Ethereum-based to social tokens and Celo-based social tokens. And we've built a Ethereum to Celo bridge workflow, mm. which allows us to conduct all internal transactions from one social stack to another wallet to another on the Celo blockchain. And so that makes the wallet very carbon friendly. 
uh, allows us to provide instant transactions. And the most important component is there's no gas fees because all of it runs on the seller blockchain. And there's very minimal gas fees that we're able as social stack to abstract from the user. Um, and so we've solved a couple key challenges around social tokens right now with the wallet, which is uh, simple email based accounts to send and receive, and then no gas fees. And then the final component in the toolkit is our social stack community app, um, which basically facilitates that earning and redemption where an issuer can basically create community tasks for their community to complete, reward them with tokens when they do complete it. And then there's a storefront where they can put NFTs or products for sale that can only be bought with the issuer's social token. Um, and so we've basically built out this toolkit right now that is reflective of where social tokens are right now. And we're slowly going to put out our roadmap and our vision for where this goes as social tokens, as an asset class, gain more liquidity and get more mature. It's super cool. And one thing that I love that you and Solo are doing, you're so creator centric, right? You're so creator focused that, like you said, you're you're innovating on the wallet side from an email based web client type of wallet, right? You're you're innovating also uh, on a few other features. But one thing that came to mind that I learned from your team that you guys basically collabed on this way to, to prove uh, listenership for for audio, right? And reward creators based on that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, one of the, or uh, uh, actually the first ever uh, social token on Cello uh, is called ATRU. It's the social token of the African Tech Roundup podcast, which is currently the leading tech podcast uh, in Africa covering the tech uh, industry. And so that was the podcast that I built with my partner in my previous company, but now he runs that full time. He's based in Johannesburg, South Africa. He's a Zimbabwean broadcaster who's been um, broadcasting about business and tech in Africa for, for many years now. Um, and so they've implemented something that they're calling proof of play on the cello blockchain. And so what they're doing is they're allowing listeners to earn their social token every time that they listen to an episode. And right now it's, it's a very, it's, it's, you know, in its MVP form. So at that, so right now it's, it's being run through essentially a Google form. Um, and they are doing payouts at the end of every month to listeners that actually, um, prove through the Google form, there's a password in the middle of every episode. And so you have to um, listen to the episode. They put it at a different point every single time. And then you register that password in the Google form to show that you actually listen to that episode. And then you can earn some tokens. And so, so it's a really valuable way for the podcast to do a couple of things. One is um, any listener that signs up, you know, they have to register their cello address. They have to register their email, their name, and a lot of questions that kind of help them identify more about this listener. And now they can see which episodes the listener is tuning into, uh, which episodes are actually mining, you know, the token through this Google form method. And it's a really powerful way to get the, um, to have the most engaged listeners kind of rise to the top. Right. The, the, the people that have the most tokens are going to be the ones that listen to the most episodes. And then on the flip side, they're setting up all sorts of unique ways for the listeners to actually redeem the social token. So they're reserving ad space that can only be bought uh, with their social token. Um, they're reserving podcast consulting time from the host uh, that you know can only be redeemed with a social token. And they're creating and establishing a network of African tech conferences where you're going to need to hold a minimum balance of ATRU in a, any seller-based wallet and show you know that that you hold it there, and you can receive discounts to a whole network of different African tech conferences. And so it's a really compelling use case for like, you know, how a podcaster can, can again, like use this technology to really deepen their relationship with their fans and allow the most engaged fans to kind of rise to the top. Um, because as, as a fan of your favorite podcaster, like you want to be seen, like you, you want them to know that you're like really deeply connected with them and a part of their community. And they listen to you every, every you know week or month or however long you, you put the, uh, you put the episode out. And so it's a really compelling use case. You know what that reminds me of? There's this uh, producer and uh, songwriter. His name is Harrison First. He has a social token first. Uh, he was also on season one of Mint. Uh, and he did something similar with his songs where he basically rewards people who engage with his music and play with his music library, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, right? He basically tweeted, he's like, for those who can tell me how many times I mentioned this word in this song, 
uh, which proves that basically they listen to the song, right? Get an X amount of first tokens or get rewarded with a certain amount of things, right? Uh, which is, it's a very similar use case, but how do you, how do you streamline that? How do you make that process more, less manual, I guess, uh, and more, I guess, automatic? Have you guys thought about that? Cause it's such a powerful solution. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's like one of the, I guess, core questions right now in the entire space, because there's a lot of like, there's a lot of developers. There are some people that have launched a social token and are kind of like, you know, operating and testing it out and feeling out. There's definitely a connection, like a disconnect between the two of those, which is like developer, like actual useful tools getting built and like what social token issuers need. And like, um, you know, we were a part of the last seed club cohort and like, you know, even within seed club, there's like still this dynamic of like the toolkit that exists right now is so early that a lot of what we want to like enable, like it has to be like the manual process. Um, and so for us, like, you know, with the podcast, we are thinking of like, what's the most simple tool that we can build that would enable the broadest range of like, like use cases and uses, um, where, so we're actually thinking a little bit more on the reverse of the earning side, which is creating a way for a, uh, token permissioned RSS feed, basically where you know, this, this concept of like holding minimum balances of token in your wallet in order to unlock, you know, access tiers. Um, that's a really compelling use case for a podcaster. If they're able to create different RSS feeds that you need different levels of token to uh, unlock access to, which means like you publishing the mint, like you need to, you know, maybe hold a hundred mint tokens to unlock the ad free RSS feed. And maybe there's another RSS feed that you need a thousand mint tokens. And that will unlock, you know, an additional episode per week or month or whatever you want to enable there. Um, so right now, I think, again, there's social tokens 2021 and there's social tokens 2025, right? What do we need to build now where like we can actually meet the market where it's at versus like building for the future? And so like that's solely what we're thinking about right now, like that simple use case of token permissioning that RSS feed. Yeah, I'm excited to see it kind of come to life over the next uh, few years. And we'll we'll get to the question where what does uh, 2025 and 2030 kind of look like for you uh, in social stack? Uh, but I, I guess my, my next question is people tend to think, I mean, I don't want to categorize it, but I'll, I'll just be a straight shooter. Do you think mission-driven communities can reach let's say like a, a billion dollar in valuation. Do you think that's a, a real world scenario? Um, I get, hmm. it, well, so is that, I guess that's more of a question of can social token community, like are you saying for one social token community? I guess for one social token community, right? That's mission driven, right? That's very uh, social driven in a sense. Um, can they reach a billion dollar valuation you think? Yes not for a little while <laughs> I, think, okay. I don't think any i don't think any social token community even like the, the number one uh should reach a billion dollars right now there's not enough value right in space right now to like to to justify something like that maybe in the maybe in the next bull run in 2024 2025 we'll get there um but when, when we say mission driven you know what what we think about in this space is like Social token communities, it's it's a way to align co-creative efforts and align people around a specific mission that the community wants to achieve together. And I think that that's where we need to go with this space. And so an example of that is a surfboard company. I can't name the company name yet because they haven't announced it, but they're basically going to be using their social tokens solely as a way to incentivize people to um, participate in ocean like beach cleanup days, mm -hmm. plant mangroves. Um, and do a lot of behavior around recycling and environmental cleanup. And then on the flip side, you know, the community can redeem those tokens for heavily discounted surfboards, right? And so when we say mission driven, it's a question of what are you, what behavior are you incentivizing with your token? And like that will over time start to align the community's behavior towards accomplishing meaningful missions. Um, and so I wouldn't like, and so mission driven isn't necessarily like, uh, um, 
you're not putting barriers around right. what the community can become. It's just like kind of psychologically framing social tokens in a way where it's like, this is, this is a really meaningful technology where mm-hmm. you can come around and connect with each other and have economic incentives towards accomplishing meaningful things that we all know need to get done, but currently aren't getting done. So it's like a little bit, if, you, if you're familiar with Charles Eisenstein's sacred economics concept, like we're as a team, we're, we're definitely inspired by that. And like we want money to be just like a new framing of money where it's, it's some, something more meaningful than just, you know, a piece of paper that someone that, that, that somebody else says has value. What's up, guys? Adam Levy here. Sorry for the quick pause, but I want to give some love to our five NFT sponsors who are making this episode happen. They are Coinvise, Poop, Cello, Social Stack, and Prime Down. First off, on Coinvise, you can create a personal or community owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Discover more by visiting coinvise.co today. Next up, we have POAP, or short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, who enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT technology, POAP facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities, and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. Collect or launch your own POAP today by visiting poap.xyz. Next up, we have Social Stack a platform for communities, brands, and creators to build mission-driven social token economies, offering an easy-to-use non-custodial wallet with a suite of open-source community engagement tools. Social Stack makes it simple to bring your community into Web3 and be a part of creating an open-source, gratitude-driven future for social tokens. Create a free social token wallet, discover mission-driven social token communities, or apply to launch your own token on Social Stack by visiting socialstack.co today. Next up, we have Celo. Are you looking for an ecosystem of dApps, currencies, and tokens that can connect you with people no matter their device, carrier, or country? Well, say hello to Celo, a mobile-first platform that makes crypto dApps and payments accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. Celo supports thousands of projects from builders, developers, and artists who every day build applications and issue tokens from all over the world. Visit celo.org today to learn more. And last but not least, we have PrimeDAO, a collective of DeFi builders and DAO veterans attempting to turn DeFi into a more cooperative ecosystem by creating DAO-to-DAO interactions. The first solution to go live is Prime Launch a launchpad experience for DAOs built in collaboration with Balancer. If you plan on launching a DAO, head over to prime.xyz to access a network of partners and tools that will jumpstart your DAO development today. All right, back to the episode. Yeah, uh, I like, I, I have a hard time. You know, part of me sees like all these like micro economies uh, there's this article that Cooper Turley and Kinjal from Blockchain Capital wrote on how crypto is birthing all these micro economies, right? And how it's going to be partly driven through these social token networks and whatnot. And I have a hard time imagining what a billion dollar like network may look like, what, what that's going to be driven by, right? Who are going to be the key participants, how decentralized it's going to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So by asking that question, I, I'm really just looking to see like, how do you envision that? How does social stack envision that, right? And is this a situation where, is this gonna be like a product driven type of social token, right? Where it reaches a billion dollar valuation because it has a lot of revenue and it has a team and it's set up in a way where it's able to drive profits, et cetera. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, how how do you kind of see that? Do Do you see these social tokens being more, social communities do you see them being more product driven communities do you see them more service driven communities driven by social tokens powered and framed through social tokens like how do you kind of think about that so i mean that's a great question so first answer is it seems that nfts are going to be the drivers of social token economies and the way like however that's facilitated i think you know i think it's going to be facilitated in a way where you have some sort of 
connective tissue, some sort of theme or some sort of mission that aligns all the participants' co-creative efforts around. Um, and so like an example that I've been thinking about for a while, no one's really doing, like imagine if there was a solar punk social token and it was a central aggregator for artists to contribute solar punk themed music, art, movies, media, and there was a whole structure of auctioning, like a whole system for auctioning, a system for corporates to interface with the DAO and get services from it. So I think, you know, we're, we're going into a world and I'm more bullish on community-based and community-driven social tokens than other forms of social tokens. Um, but I think we're going into a world where, where DAOs will be aggregators of talent and people will contract with the DAO. The DAO will provide people on the, um, the contracting side with work. So there'll you know, be companies, uh, startups, other DAOs that contract with a specific DAO that has a, like proved their core competency of a specific task, theme, uh, ability to complete a, cer a certain mission. Um, so I think the compelling billion dollar DAOs come in the form of broad community-based DAOs that have pr proven their ability to create differentiated products and services uh, in some sort of area where there's a lot of demand. And then there's a bunch of revenue coming in by other, you know, outside parties contracting with that DAO. Um, that sort of, you know, social driven DAO is where I see things going on the community token side. Um, and then there's going to be all sorts of like smaller, in smaller versions of that, that are maybe like brand tokens where it starts off just as like a reward point system on steroids, but then eventually turns into something where the brands that are honest about their values um, will attract people that want to participate in that. Um, and so I, I mean, to be honest, you know, I don't think anyone who tells you that they have any idea where the space is going is, 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 is being honest. Um, just because we're still at such an early stage that like, you know, the direction that this space goes in is whether we as like the active builders in it decide where it goes in, you know? And so I would love to hear your ideas on it. Cause I, <laughs> cause I, I, cause I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll echo the same thing. I obviously, I don't know if I knew then things would be a little bit different right now, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, like some of the top social token projects that come to mind are, like you said, friends with benefits in whale right now. Right. Another good one that comes to mind is, is Ali, even though it's not in the billion dollar range, nowhere near none of these projects are, I'm just thinking about like an individual creator going public and launching a token on behalf of their brand for their audience and building interesting utility frameworks that incentivizes buying and selling of that token. Ali comes to mind because she realizes that, okay, I do something really well and that's game. I play games. I live stream it and my fans love it. Let's try to take it one step further. Let's try to do gaming tournaments. And the only way to access those gaming tournaments is with Ali coin, right? You win, you spend, and you earn an Ali coin, right? And you start off small, but then you scale. And then you're seeing her kind of like develop her social token now into a uh, like a more of a modern day fan club through her DAO, right? That's that's slowly being transitioned into that. And who knows a network effect that that will bring as she gets bigger on Twitch and on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if they're gonna be necessarily like individually driven, right? Through these individual creators. Like imagine if Justin Bieber had his own social token, right? And he was doing really cool, unique concert utility uh, or, um, fan club merch utility, right? Or whatever it may be that he's doing to incentivize the buying and selling. Like I see a huge network effect between that or if Kylie Jenner were to launch her own social token and assuming we're five, 10 years from now and her fans understand crypto and they've onboarded and they have wallets, whatever, right? Like I could see her reaching hundreds of millions of dollars in valuation for her token if she constructed her, her network and her flow and her funnel correctly. You know, I could, I could definitely well, but, see but it. That's like the core piece of it because there are celebrities that have gone into the, uh, you know, quote unquote, have gotten into the social token space. Right. Um, you know, like Lil Yachty comes to mind. 
And like that is a, it's a textbook example of like what not to do. Like it was right. very, very inappropriate the way he's gone about it. Um, and it's like the antithesis of what we're looking to do in the space. Like this isn't about, this isn't a new way for you to make more money off your fans. This is a way for you to connect deeper with your fans in a meaningful way. And when I see, you know, celebrities just straight up selling their social token um, and then not really following up, like it's very inappropriate. And it's, 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 uh, I think points to a larger trend that's happening that I actually realized with the podcast company, which is the death of the celebrity and the death of like the ability for a celebrity to just like have that like lore about them where they can just do things and get away with it. Whereas in this new world, like we're, we're now in a world where the community convener has completely replaced the celebrity and anyone that doesn't properly fulfill that role um, there's, they're not going to, nothing that they do is going to be sustainable. Yeah. When you think about funnel, uh, or funnels, excuse me, uh, you really like the way I explain this to creators, like they have to completely reimagine what marketing and communication kind of looks like on their end through Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, right? Like everything that they do now needs to be centered around their token to an extent, right? From pros they have to the events that they have to uh, music they release, like they have to completely reimagine this funnel. Would you agree or disagree? Like how, how do they kind of go by marketing and, and incentivizing people to buy into this without doing a little Yachty case, right? Without just launching something and just forgetting your fans. Cause I might even argue that little Yachty has no idea what social tokens are. And he just saw this as like a cool thing to do. And he didn't know that, okay, now that I launched this, my next music video needs to have a social token twist to it as well for the people who have, you know what I mean? Like how, how do you think creators should be thinking about their funnel? Well, I think it's a question of what behavior is the highest value behavior that they want their community members to take. Um, like, do they want them to subscribe to their email newsletter? Like, do they want them to retweet something? Do they want them to join their private membership community where they meet every month on zoom? Like, like what are the highest value actions? that your community members can take. And then you want to incentivize that behavior with token rewards. So I add this like most core and basic, like that's, that's really the answer. Like that's how you incorporate tokens in your funnel. And then beyond that, how can you get creative? So one of the, um, we're talking to a creator right now, a big YouTuber that does a lot of challenges. Like they, their audience, you know, it's one of those things where it's like comment below on what you want us to do in the next video. And they're, their fans basically comment like, I want you to eat 20 hot dogs in two minutes, like some, some crazy challenge. And then each video they do challenges. And so for them, we're talking about, okay, let's, let's flip that on its head. You give challenges to your fans, whether it's, you know, clean up your neighborhood, your neighborhood park, cook a bunch of meals for the homeless, you know, do, do something good. And then you can earn token rewards by recording it putting it on Twitter with a hashtag and then submit that, you know, uh, you can submit on the, uh, the social stack community app. We have a feature where you can set tasks and then upload proof that you completed the task. It's like, that's a really compelling way for a uh, market, like a viral marketing campaign, leveraging your fans to have them complete meaningful tasks, give them token rewards for completing it. And then they're all tweeting it out and going viral themselves. Right. And so like, that's a really compelling way to leverage tokens in your marketing strategy. Um, on social stack community, we also have the ability to create influencer links where you can tie token rewards to that link. And so now instead of like creating a, uh, doing an influencer campaign where you get 10 influencers and pay them, you know, thousand dollars or like, you know, pay them whatever. Now you can give them a link where they can earn your social token for each sign up that they drive. Um, and so it's, it's really like the possibilities here are, are endless. You're only really limited by the tools that you have at your disposal right now and your imagination. Yeah. I love that example. That's such a good example. Uh, do you think that's going to actually be done? Are they open to that or are they scared yeah. to, to mess with crypto? No, not at all. Yeah. I mean, okay. there are, there are we have had conversations where creators are scared to mess with crypto. That's, that's, I think this past 
year of NFTs have like removed that barrier for most creators. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that. I'll, I'll be participating in that when that comes out. <laughs> uh, I want to I wanna ask you, uh, what, what was the most important thing you've kind of been taught throughout this process of starting Social Stack? Mm. Well, I would say the most important thing is just like getting a full scope and awareness of how early we are. It's pretty crazy. Just like the conversations I have with like some create with creators, the um, the the deep dive I've done into the space when it comes to like what open source tools even exist right now to like enable this stuff. Like it it's it, it continues to like bewilder me of just how early we are, um, which which is both good and bad, right? Like the nature of crypto is like the earlier you get into the space, the more you'll reap the rewards. And so it's a, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but like, that's a continued, just like, whoa, like we're so early. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. I would say that's the core thing. And then the other thing is just like, um, you know, with, with my podcast company, I was kind of a sole creator. Um, I, I had a team, but a team of freelancers that I would, you know, just kind of on demand use. And so me and my capacity as a leader, like I've, I'm learning a lot, just how to kind of lead a team, set examples for my behavior. Um, always be very impeccable with my word and, you know, just really think deeply about some of the ideals in the crypto space of decentralization, personal sovereignty, and how do you strike a balance between, uh, you know, a leadership team of a project really, um, you know, guiding it in the way that, you know, the, the is going to be beneficial for the culture, the brand, the community versus just, you know, it's a DAO, the, the go ahead community, whatever you want. You know, so there's a balance to be struck there. Um, and it's definitely an ongoing learning process for the team. Who would you say are like the three most influential people uh, that have kind of inspired you throughout this process? Do any come to mind? Hmm. I would say Jess Sloss from Seed Club, for sure. Like he, he is somebody who is like, absolutely impeccable with his word i've never really seen anything from him where there's like been a disparity between his word and his action like like and that's very important to like it's very important in the crypto space and you don't see that that much to be honest like there's a lot of people in the crypto space that um they didn't earn their money through truth and wisdom over time they just participated in the ethereum crowd sale and that and and that shows in the way that they manage the money, the way that they act in public. Um, and so whenever I see someone that is very impeccable with their word in the space um, and always follows up on what they say they're going to do, like I, I respect that so much. And I, see, I only see that from Jess. Um, so that's definitely the first one. Um, let's see. I mean, I really like what the entire Friends with Benefits team has done. Like, I think they've set, in, in my opinion, they're the only successful social token that is in, is, is in existence. Um, and I can, we can go into that if you want, but I think what Cooper, like, it's so funny. There's, there's that meme of like, there's like the Scooby-Doo meme, meme of like, like pulling off the mask of like, um, and when you research any successful DAO, it's like, for some reason, Cooper's behind it. <laughs> like, you always get to like the point where it's like, oh, Cooper, of course, Cooper launched this. Um, so I think he's someone who's had a really deep vision for where the space is going to go. And, um, I really appreciate everything that he's done for the space just by setting an example. Um, and then let's see, I would say probably Alex Mazmej is, is another one who's like clearly a super young entrepreneur, but what he's done with Showtime is really, really impressive. And obviously he's one of the pioneers in, in, the concept of launching a personal token. Um, but I've been impressed just watching him from afar of like how he's really navigated and stepped up into a leadership capacity with Showtime. Can you talk more about the friends with benefits uh, point that you brought up? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I don't feel, I don't, I don't own any whale. Like I felt, I feel like it started off where the draw was that you're earning dividends or like you're, they're like earning uh, and sharing in like the the vault of whale. 
but they've kind of shied away from that because that's a huge like secure like obviously it's a security if you do that so i feel like there's kind of like the stale phase of that community where it's not really clear um and so i don't really consider that a successful social token um i don't feel like there's a genuine community that's formed around it other than token go up um so that's my opinion there uh and i think friends with benefits have just like really set the standard in every single way like the party that they did in miami at manny bitcoin week i was there and i was like whoa like this is this is real this is going to take social tokens and obviously friends with benefits to the next level like and it did and they did a similar one in paris which i, I would love to hear your opinion of because i wasn't able to make it yeah no it, it was great uh, I think one thing that they're doing uh, beautifully is, so I was also in the, the Miami one and the way they kind of, so you obviously had to have at the time 66 tokens or 60 tokens to get into the one in Miami, right? And there was no real way of verifying that at the door. And they kind of were just like picking people, you know, based off who they recognized to come into the party. And they realized that was a problem and they spent basically their, their treasury and the funds in their treasury, right. To kind of improve on that situation and created a new verification model, uh, based off social token holders, right. FWB holders on who could enter the party in Paris that was taking place during ETCC, which was done beautifully organized really efficiently. Um, and I think obviously the, the concept of friends with benefits, right. It's a, it's a very beneficial thing, uh, because, it's like the it's like this the the what's the word the club in in they have a the Soho House right you know the Soho House the franchises right so it's like it's like an internet Soho House in a sense right uh, minus the the real estate and my minus the the bouginess uh, but if you're in the Soho House you get a good network and typically people who work in crypto are a part of friends with benefits or at least that's what you've seen so it's been like a cool network to kind of join and participate in. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think <clears throat> I'm a fan of whale because of, of whale shark himself and the community and the diehard fans that they've built around NFTs. And when you're talking about like mission driven and like mindedness, uh, whale does come to mind simply because of their methodology for collecting NFTs and, and the like mindedness of people in that group, right? So they share interests uh, and they all collectively hold this token. And who's to say, <clears throat> excuse me, that friends with benefits isn't also to that extent price go up. Like that's the whole point of the benefits part, right? Like every so often they increase how many tokens you need to hold and how much money you got to swap into their pools. So I think, I think there's, there's room for all, right? I think there's different models and things are still being experimented with and we'll see how they kind of prevail. But yeah, it's interesting to hear your point of view because you're, you're coming from the perspective of building one of these platforms to help more creators and you're also joining these communities to see what they're doing right what they're doing wrong and kind of taking those mental notes to improve onto future creators right um so i think i think there's i think there's room for both so let, let's let's continue i want to ask you um what, what do you feel like is a common myth about social tokens that you're trying to debunk if any mm. I mean, I, I think the main one is just that it's not like a real, there's nothing real there. And like the, people, <laughs> like the people that say that, like, like they don't have vision. They don't, they don't see where it's going. Like if you're looking at the socialist token space right now and like judging it for like the snapshot in its current existence, like, sure, that's fair, but you have to have a vision for where this can go and, and is going. Um, and as a part of that, you know, it's. Uh, it's very important that people with integrity really step up and take leadership positions within the sphere because there's, you know, there's no saying where it's going to go. Like maybe it's quite possible that by 2030, we're all just traded like a stock market, you know, like that's it's quite possible. That's the vision of social tokens that actually wins out. Um, I'm building and I know many other people in the space are building so that that's not the reality that we're building. And so how do you prevent that by building other things, by building others? So there's there, like, this is the one thing I realized in my twenties, like there's, mm -hmm. nothing, there, there's absolutely nothing for you to fight against out there. Everything is in here. Every enemy that you perceive out in like, it's, it's something that you have often here. 
And so there's nothing to fight against out there. If you feel like there's something wrong or perverted out there in the world, then you need to take on the responsibility as much as you have the capacity to do to build better solutions, new solutions that make that obsolete. And if you build something that's true, honest, and a better solution, then people will adopt it. What do you think the future of social tokens kind of look like five to 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. I know you touched upon it uh, briefly, but talk to me more. Build that, build that painting for me for a minute. Well, I think we hit enough. I, I think we hit a similar hype cycle to what we're seeing right now in NFTs, where you have this kind of mass adoption within a specific subset of the creator economy. So like NFTs right now, it's like artists are like really like getting the full value and brunt of like what NFTs are and can be. And I think over time, we're going to start to see that bleed over into other areas of the creator economy, but there's definitely going to be like a, you know, early majority, late majority, or like that, that type of adoption cycle. Um, and social tokens are going to be the same. I think we're, we're, you know, where NFTs were in 2018, we're caught, we're close to that point of the adoption cycle of social tokens, if not, uh, like, you know, there or a little bit beyond it. Um, but I really think that five to 10 years, social tokens kind of become this, this world of new experimental models of social backed currencies that in my opinion should be mediums of exchange and really creates a world where communities, brands, creators with influence are able to incentivize positive behavior and positive action that help to create a regenerative world that we all wanna see. Um, but now we have the economic incentives and economic commun like community driven structures to create that. And I think it was Charlie Munger that said, you know, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And so we finally have the tools to come from scratch, create the incentives, create the systems and structures that will result in the outcomes that we want to see, which is regenerative planet, uh, uplifting communities and emerging economies and advancing and co-creating together meaningful causes. And I think that that's where the space is going to go because there are people building towards that and we're going to win. I love it. I think that's a perfect place to end off. Uh, Andrew, before I let you go, shout yourself out. Where can we find you? Where can we find social stack? Give us the whole, the whole shebang. So you, you can find social stack at socialstack.co. Uh, that's our website. We're on every social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, at try social stack. And then my handle is below at the wits Carlton. Um, it's like the Ritz call Carlton, but with a W instead of an R. Um, and that's definitely the best way to connect with me. And, um, yeah, like super open. We'll love to hear feedback, like, like social stack to the extent that we like, we want this to be a co-creative vehicle. We have kind of a vision for where the product needs to go. And we also have a desire and a vision for where the culture and the community needs to go. And we want to kind of co-create that with the initial creators on the platform and with the initial community that actually engages. So um, join our Discord, the link's on our Twitter handle, and uh, we'd love to see you guys there. Amazing. Thank you for being on, man. Thank you.